it was rather a kind of complicated conspiracy and a secret letter sent to me to Russia, yeah? And so I came here and it was my first teaching position ever. And it was very, very quite satisfactory. <laughs> <laughs> so now coming to the, my talk, so it must be connections with physics. And so I start with little discussion, which I hope will not insult physicists who are present here. It will be kind of physical motivation, but of course I, I don't expect to take it for the physics. So the picture I have in mind is as follows. You have something like a, be like a pendulum, but I prefer it to have with several joints. And just to make it more interesting, I want to be surrounded by something, giving some sound, yeah? So it will be inside of a bell. So I can not, not only see, but hear this, yeah? So this will be an object. So I give it an object like that. Oh, it's just an object. And then what you do, you put it everywhere. For example, in this, imagine you have a cubical lattice in the space. Ah, uh, yes, cubical lattice. So points everywhere. You put one at, at each point. And then you start moving them around. They move more or less in random. The lattice is periodic, but they move it any way they want. And you hear some sound, yeah? So you hear something. Also, you see something, but I don't want to see what you see because you see too much. Yeah? You just, just you hear the overall noise. And then you ask, what from this overall noise you can say about individual one, individual bell? So let me give an example. So this <coughs> it works so beautifully, though this example will be not much in my talk. Example when the bell is extremely simple, it just consists of finitely many atoms of finite weight. So we have a probability space consisting of water with some mass, m1, m2, whatever, m3 is good enough for me, yeah? And as a measure, you put it at every point of the space, and you want to look at something as a shared totality of them, some physical system built out of them, and you're looking at this system to tell something about, this, about these atoms, yeah? So what you can recapture. And so what you will recapture in, a, in the f framework which I developed will be the entropy of this, which will be the sum, of this mi log mi. Yeah? If you have a bunch of numbers, positive numbers, sum is one, there is this remarkable quantity attached, which is hard to justify in inside of this space. But if you take many of them, uh, this will be the only thing which remains, is just this number. Individual mi disappear. So this kind of what you want to do. So that's enough for physics. Now, now it will be not, not very physical from this moment on. So, so what's it? Non-physical. Non, non so I have my object, yeah? Again, it was my pendulum, I give a name to it. And of course, X is not, is not this object, I certainly don't give a name to it, but what we have is a space of its state, yeah? So we have this many joints, and then we can move around, and this will be some, so many dimensional space. It may be, in this example, you just find it many points with weights, or it may be actually a manifold or, or something. And this has by something like in the background. So I think about this kind of a physical system which will be sitting on every side of a space. And then there are sides and there is this system. And then, of course, the space of sides. So you need some name for it. Imagine it will be, it may be a lattice in the space, but I want to think of this abstractly as being a graph, yeah? So there are vertices where they sit and then there will be edges. Actually, I shall come back to edges on the framework of the bell. So it will be a set with some extra structure, typically the structure of a graph. And then we can see that all, so we put this x in every vertex. So I have an x sticking from every vertex. And then the space of overall states will be, this, will be Cartesian power of that. And this will be the exponent. So we take x by x by x. And this will be a delta. Eh? Or we can think about this and the space of function, from the background space to this x. All maps. So function from x to there. These are our function spaces. These are kind of discrete function spaces. The background is discrete. Later on, this will be a continuous space, yeah? Like Euclidean space. But so this is for the moment. So this is what we have. And then, so what we want to do? So this is a kind of an operation. I want to describe. I start with the space x, and then I have a functor depending on my delta, which gives you my space x to so the delta power delta. I want to describe, of course, what is a category I want to lend 
in, right? So I start with the object of any category, maybe I think about it as a geometric space. Maybe finite set, topological manifold, the topological space, smooth manifold, algebraic manifold, whichever. You choose maybe a group even, maybe an algebraic object. And then, and then we have to say, so what will be the maps morphism in this new category? So what the difference is, yeah, if you just take it, it's coordinate-wise, so little happens. Right, you just have the same we had before, it's repeated many times. So we have to forget something. We have to change our point of view and forget something. And so this will be space kind of more symmetric, more geometric when we forget some of the structure and what's part of the structure we remember. And the case I want to emphasize at this stage will be when delta is sufficiently symmetric. And so there is a group gamma acting here, here transitively. Okay? And it actually may be simple transitive action. I wouldn't mind, it will be simple. So we have simple transitive action of gamma on delta. So essentially the same as the group, but what's important, principle of homogeneous space. So I have a graph, it's homogeneous. On this, there are functions of this graph. So gamma acts on delta, right? And thus, it also acts on x to the delta in a trivial way, which is called the shift action. Yeah? This is the shift space. So out of single simple sp little x, we produce this inf a huge yeah, product. And it will be infinite dimensional if this was of positive dimension. This will be infinite dimensional. It may be zero dimensional, like in this example. It will still zero dimensional. But now it is a space. And what I emphasize in the space is the action. Well, for the reason, so why actually do that? Yeah. Maybe I give a couple of uh, motivations. What we want to understand, indeed, is spaces like that, yeah, like spaces of configurations, kind of physically motivated things. And um, we want to develop some systematic way to talk about them. And the group action does give you this possibility, that's to talk about them. Right? We, we want to describe the spaces and just develop some intuition. And then we need a language. And this seems to be a good language. And I shall indicate an example where it works so well. So in this product, you have to say exactly what the structure is. If it's topological space, of course, multiplies. You have topological structure. If it's algebraic manifold, you must be careful what you mean by this infinite product, what the structure is. Yeah? If this is a structure of a pro-algebraic variety, which I have in mind, but you have to say it. But anyway, imagine there is a kind of structure there. And then the maps you consider, the category here, when you have x and y in the same group x, you consider maps preserving the structure and gamma equivariant. So it's very easy to say. Well, we can say why these maps are there, whatever. In a second, I shall indicate there are plenty of these maps. Yeah? They really generalize ordinary maps in the sense that any time you have a map from x to y, right? of course, you have a, a, a map there. But there are by far more maps here than there. And so in larger category, and I shall again, I shall in a second explain what kind of things you gain. Now, coming back to this example, so what you, what you have here, you have finitely many atoms with total mass 1. So this is space x. So it's a finite measure space. So you have a finite measure space, and just use the group will be z. So I take this, this space, just sequences. And the group acts there, so you have a measure space with an action. And then you say when the two spaces are equal in this category, when they are the isomorphic under this sense. And they are isomorphic if and only if the original spaces has equal entropies. That the theorem of Shannon, Kolmogorov, and Ornstein, yeah, it has many stages, is highly non-trivial theorem, saying that once you pass to this category and can identify two finite measure spaces, if these powers were isomorphic with, with the group action, it's if and only if they had equal entropies. And so it gives a very good definition of the entropy. Yeah? You cannot beat that. Yeah, it's very, most natural, but unfortunately, it's hard to prove. There is no simple proof of that. But from a kind of mathematical point of view, this is the most kind of uh, convincing way to introduce entropy. Right? I, 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 well, actually, Shannon, of course, in his work, motivated entropy, but it was not so, not, not so elegant, though, of course, expressing the same idea. And now we just try to plot on and <coughs> try to see what other things you can see. So I will, I'm not going to go into this discussion. It's too difficult for this, um, for me, but um, so what else, what else can you kind of recapture? What else can you recapture, say, from this example? Mm. And 
so and so, so what will be other what will be other spaces at, at which I want to look at so there are kind of two um, kind of have th problems I want to solve simultaneously, okay, to, to think exhibit, exhibit simultaneously. One, to, sh to, to tell you what environments to look at. Yeah? For example, and this is not a real discussion, how to express, even granted this number in your hands, how to express it in this new language when you pass through the space with an action. It's one thing. And another, just to have enough examples to justify what you do. So, I indicated one example, for example, of this bell, and I have it at every point on this space. And you have a system, and they have, then this move independently. But of course, you can have something more sophisticated. You may have relations between your pendulum. They may interact in some simple way. For example, you may have one here. And there may be a rigid rod some way here, right? You have another one. And again, you have a rigid rod here. And now you have a coherent system. Now they move under this constraint. So it's not a product system anymore. So it will be some subsystem inside of this product. And these are called kind of subshifts of finite type in a slightly more limited context. So the, it's again infinite dimensional space, but defined by a difference equation. It's going to be a difference equation giving you this constraint. And it's local, so we describe completely on this picture, right? It's by one indicating one single rod. And then saying you repeat the same thing periodically over your, over your lattice. And then you may ask again, what kind of object is there? What of properties of space is x, underlying space is x, can be attributed to this y? So what you know about this y, it has a group action on it. So the space with a group action. And once you're using this action, you want to attribute some properties of this x. And this, the most elementary and basic property is dimension of this. For example, what you can say about dimension. And this will be. Uh, essential part of my discussion. <coughs> of course, you, have, you can do next step. Yeah, there are two steps where you can build up the spaces. So first, you take subspaces, then you take quotient spaces. For example, imagine indeed that you're listening, or instead of looking at these bells, you listen to them, and, and you have some filters in your ears, yeah? So you don't quite hear everything. So it will be some quotient of your system which you observe. And then, again, you have the same question then, but this is much more, um, you'll bring maybe too far. So at the first approximation, we have subspaces. And uh, what will be other examples? These are kind of uh, discrete examples. And where I imagine my graph being a cubic, cubical lattice, and so something sitting on every cubical on every side. And another class of examples come from geometry or from analysis. And these will be spaces of maps, more traditional function spaces. For example, you can consider space of holomorphic maps from complex space to Pn. You know, and just all holomorphic maps, yeah? This is actually too big a space to be, uh, I'm not quite comfortable with this space for these purposes. It's very far, very different from those examples. But you can bring them to the common ground, they become really neighbors. If you restrict these maps f by the condition that differential, the normal differential is bounded by some constant. So give me, uh, given the constant you bound there, it's still a huge space, and then it becomes comparable in size to the space of these pendulums Maybe with those joints. And this I'm going to explain why it is so. And the third example appropriate for this meeting will be the space of minimal, this may be more general map, maybe harmonic maps, whatever, but holomorphic, the most attractive ones. And you can consider instead of Cn, the space of all complex sub varieties of given dimension k. And, uh, or it may be more general minimal sub varieties. And again, you have limited their size in a, in a suitable sense so to have a compact space. So they have to have uniformly bounded density, which I shall explain later on. So, and again, in all these examples, we have a group action. So here is just Cn act there. And so in this space, the space of maps, there is the action of this Cn. And it carries, especially if you make this limitation, bound derivative, you have a compact space. The essential features of the holomorphic functions, or meromorphic functions, rather, are, are encoded in this action. And uh, while I just cannot quite do that, but I believe that this is the right framework for nonlinear theory, and just you, uh, it is, uh, when you start working in this dynamical language, it immediately absorbs much of the, the theory of complex functions. And something similar you have here. Again, in this space, we have action of the background space, compact space with this action, and you can compare them in this framework. So you can bring together these kind of diverse examples. 
But of course, this dynamical system theory is very different from that from in, in usual dynamical system. Yeah, you classically you look at finite dimensional, even one dimensional phase, yeah. You make dynamic there, which is kind of from this point of view it's an impossible thing to do. You will never come to dimension zero. Yeah, you very, very far up. It's so it's a completely different kind of dynamics, but yet it has some common features, as we shall see. Now, so what we want to say about them, yeah? can we distinguish two spaces like that? So, typical questions would be, so I have two spaces, x and y, and uh, imagine that after passing through this process, I put gamma itself here, yeah? and they became isomorphic. Isomorphic in the corresponding category. They were, say, topological spaces, and these became equivariantly homeomorphic. When you can say that the original space were homeomorphic, but it's thrown out. Say, for measure space, we saw it happening, yeah? You have finite measure spaces, you go to this process, the only thing which remains with them, their entropy. So what remains here? How much remains? For example, what happens to dimension? Right? This is the first question yes, I, I want to discuss, and I must admit, I don't know the full answer, yeah? So I cannot prove or disprove that if the two spaces isomorphic, this have, must have the same dimension. These are compact topological spaces, say, or compact manifolds, for general group gamma. However, we can do it for some groups. For example, for the lattices, which we were discussing before, for abelian groups. And so, <clears throat> my point first, to explain what is dimension of this creature with respect to the group action. So, which will be similar to what is done for the entropy, right? So, just to motivate it, I just say a couple of words about topological entropy, no, not, not the usual entropy. So topological entropy comes from cardinality. Yeah? You have a finite set, x. Then the, basic, the entropy of this set, topological entropy, is just log of this cardinality. Just accept this uh, terminology. And then, if you pass to this thing, you take this x to the power gamma, you also can define topological entropy, which you can write this way. It's just, it's mean entropy. It's just entropy per side. So you divide by gamma. It's, divide, it's actually defined by dividing at some moment by the group. It is, I don't want to, my definition will kind of reconstruct it. I will be talking about dimension. So it, you start with cardinality, and then you go to this entropy, and it's defined not for all groups, only for special groups, which I say in a second. And then one knows that if two such spaces, x and y, to the gamma, are gamma equivariant homeomorphic, then the original spaces had equal entropies. So because you can ex extrapolate this entropy from a finite set to the entropy there and get the same answer. So, so <clears throat> and the same is true for dimension. This I'm going, so for entropy is quite classical thing, and I want to do the same for dimension, and to my surprise, it was not kind of, I couldn't find it in the literature and spoke to people in the dynamical system, apparently it never appeared, but if somebody will claim it, I will not surprised, yeah? It still looks to me a very kind of elementary notion, and certainly physicists have pretty certain thought of, thought of that, yeah? You have physical system, which has so many, like this system of my pendulums, you have so many degree of freedom, and you have so many uh, restrictions, yeah? You count, so they take their difference, and this will be mean dimension. And of course, you have to make sense of this counting, which unfortunately doesn't make sense for all groups gamma, of, or for all graphs for this purpose. Yeah? I prefer to think in terms of graphs than groups, yeah, because the group structure is not crucial till the, kind of the last moment. So how we do that? Whether it's group or graph or whatever, how we define mean dimension so, of a space with a group action. So, now we have a, a very general situation. We have compact topological space. I prefer it to be metrizable, yeah? Which is, there, there will be a metric that will disappear every moment, but it's slightly easier to talk when there is a metric. which acted upon by a group gamma. <coughs> and I want to define mean dimension of the space, yeah? So it will be dimension of the space kind of divided by gamma. So I want to make the definition. An example we have in mind that my x was this background space of the gamma, and I want to recapture the dimension of this base. So how to proceed? So I just will imitate the definition, useful definition of the entropy. So how we go about that? So as I said, 
what I have is a compact metrizable space of this metric. I will be using the metric, but then of course the construction must be independent upon this choice. So I, I, I call this metric like that, yeah? X minus X prime absolute value, just convenient to call it this way. Then I can transport it by every element of gamma, because gamma X in this space transport my metric. So I have a family of metrics. So I have a space X, and there are many metrics there, which I'm going to use, yeah. But then I need something else, and I need a <coughs> exhaustion of gamma by subsets. So I fix some exhaustion. It actually doesn't have to be an exhaustion, just sequence of subsets in gamma. This cardinality going to infinity, which not again not crucial, but just sequence of subsets. You can think about that eventually it will be like exhaustion of a lattice by boxes, yeah. But a priori it can be anything. It will be so I have the subsets. And with respect to this exhaustion, I will define my by dimension. So it actually will be dimension, not exactly dividing by gamma, but you divide by these omegas. And thus, in general, it will depend how you choose, how you choose the sequence. In good cases, it will, it will not. So, so now what we have? Just we can stop at this moment and forget much of what we has been already said. We can forget the group action, but what we remember, we have a space and a family of metric associated to gamma. And what we know about gamma is nothing, just set, just indexing my matrix, my just family of matrix. And out of this, I'm going to produce, I'm going to produce a dimension. So how are we going to do that? And so what we do, how we use the sets, yeah? We use the sets as follows. So we just, we produce just even kind of more, as if all these metrics are the same, yeah, they're all isometric. So out of them individually, you cannot do anything. They're transport of the same metric. So the same X, essentially. But now, what we do, <coughs> we introduce the metric omega sub i, which are just soups of those metrics. So we have now a bigger matrix. And that's kind of something essential. Now, we imagine our omega is growing, we exhaust the space, and have a bigger and bigger matrix, yeah? You add more and more transformation, and you think about this as a kind of a device which stretches your point. You think your transformation actually make move points apart, yeah? And so when you add the new things, you have more and more resolution in your microscope. So you look into there and things become stretched. So your space is all the same space. But now, it changes in a sense, it becomes bigger. Metrics become bigger. So you have a growing kind of vision of your space. And then, so what you do naively, is in words, you want to define the growth of dimension of the space. You take your epsilon, it will be your scale at which you see. You define dimension on the scale epsilon in the second asymptotes. And you define dimension of the scale epsilon of this space in large space. And naturally, what you expect, it will grow proportional to cardinality of the set, because in, you remember our example when we had x being x to the gamma, and then moving this metric essentially corresponds to taking x to omega i. So uh, what, you, what you see, what you expect to see with this omega i is just this final product, wh whose dimension you expect to be, of course, the corresponding power of this space. You forget about the pathologists. With dimension, so it's manifold, there is no trouble with that. <coughs> and so you divide it by cardinality of omega i, and we go to the limit for the limit infinite to avoid mass for, for i going to infinity, and this we call something, I don't know, it will be mean dimension, but now with epsilon. And then you make epsilon going to zero, and you get our object, yeah? So it's exactly what you do in the entropy, where there, in the case of the entropy, you take the Lebesgue, we take the, the, the covering number of the space, yeah? So this is a very general recipe, except I haven't, dis haven't defined this quantity, yeah? So epsilon, 
is, is that the last moment when epsilon goes to zero is a minor. I think it depends very little on epsilon, just, just to make things independent of the metric. Here is the key limit where things happen. So space is growing, growing. You look at the space at a fixed scale. And at this scale, you measure the dimension. And because the space, in examples, is infinite dimensional, of course, yeah? Remember, x is something like that, x to the power gamma. So it's infinite dimensional space. Of omega inverse. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, you divide by this, yeah? This is what you meant, yeah? Of course, I'm sorry, I, put, I forgot to put the minus one side, yeah. <coughs> so you want to recapture back this original dimension. And um, so, but you have to say what it is, it means infinite dimensional space, the metric grows, and you want to see more and more dimensions, yeah? So, so, so the, the thing you have in mind, how, how an infinite dimensional compact space looks like, yeah? It's kind of product by one interval, but then you multiply by slightly smaller interval, and then even smaller, even smaller, and so on, right? You're getting smaller and smaller. Yeah? It can be of equal size, yeah? You want to have compact space. And so when you see at the scale epsilon, you kind of cut off the tail. So what will be the rigorous definition of that? And uh, the definition is as follows. So due to thing to Urison, very old. It is, it's a minimal dimension. So it's a minimal number, say G, such that there exists a map from your X. This is just for any space X with any metric. You have to define epsilon dimension. Such that there is a map to the g-dimensional polyhedron. So this is just honest polyhedron. Such that this map f is, is epsilon embedding. And what means epsilon embedding? It means that if it glue two points together, so if the two points go together, the distance cannot exceed epsilon. So only nearby points go together, yeah? So it's small perturbation of embedding, of, an, of conception of embedding. So all fibers of this map have diameters at most epsilon, right? That's the definition of epsilon dimension. And if you look at those examples, perfectly fits, yeah? You just can project this thing to the, to the rest of the cube, and this tail has small diameter going to zero. It is compact space, yeah? Hmm? It's clear, I hope, yeah? So, uh, we have our definition, and now we just have to look at the examples. Let's match it again, the examples. So, so, so a couple of words, yeah? So what about, so this is for any omega i. So, so what is clear from this definition, yeah? It, of course, it depends on omega i, but doesn't depend on the underlying metric in the space, right? Because if you have two different metrics, one, you know, this epsilon delta uniform continuity, you just switch from epsilon to a delta. But epsilon goes to zero anyway, so it's a material. Yeah? So epsilon disappears from the definition. Right? Because if, if something true in one metric for one epsilon, it will be true for slightly smaller, big epsilon for another metric. But epsilon disappears. So there is no question about this being correct definition. Of course, it, there are these omega i's. And this requires little kind of thinking. For example, that if you take <coughs> in the lattice, you take boxes or you take balls, and you get the same answer. It requires little thinking, it's exactly like in the case of the entropy. In general, it's unclear how much it depends on omega i's. But what is more important for us to recapture our back, up to back our, our, our dimension. So we have this example it's for some group gamma and some sequence of omega i's. When can we recapture the original dimension? And unfortunately, for general groups, I don't know. It's probably impossible. It's the same question, actually. Uh, appears with the entropy. It's not completely clear what happens if the group is not amenable. So you need some technical definition of group being amenable, or the sequence of subsets being amenable, to have a really definition which you would love, yeah, which completely captures the idea of mean dimension. Because you make some averaging of the omega i, and omega i is a set, and the set has some boundary, and the boundary effect is something you, you want to disappear. And so you want the boundary to be small. So what's the definition? So, what is the definition? 
as I, now I prefer to speak again and back in the language of graphs rather than groups, though they're equivalent at that point. And in fact, this definition can be made for any graph. You don't need any group structure. Yes, you just need a family of metrics, remember? And they <coughs> must be <coughs> well, well organized. So what is amenability here? So when you have a set, in, in, this is a finite discrete object, and this is a graph. And it may be acted upon by a group by a simple transitive action, and then the result will not depend on anything but the gr group itself. Yeah? But yes, it's easier to speak about in terms of the graph, because the graph gives you a metric on this gamma, or whichever delta you call it. Just two points within joined by an edge have distance one. If you need pass of two, it's a distance two and so forth. It is obvious metric. And once you have it, you can speak about the boundary of a set with some real number attached. So given any set omega, and this boundary consists of all those points where the ball of radius rho intersect this set as well as the complement of the set. Yeah? You cannot object to the definition. <laughs> huh? And uh, this idea of their discrete set, so I can speak about their cardinalities. And then we, we call our exhaustion amenable. I'm sorry, sequence of sets. Amenable, right? If if you take cardinality of this g rho omega, i, divided by cardinality of omega i converges to zero. So eventually boundary is negligible, which physics, I think, has some name also, right? Van Hoff condition? How it's called? Van Hoff condition, yeah? yeah? I wonder who invented this first, yeah? This conception. Hmm? But certainly not for general groups, yeah? Of course, the point of mathematicians, I think it was mathematics probably due to von Neumann. I'm not certain actually who invented that. The conception of amenability, I think, due to von Neumann. Right? Yes. Yes, yeah? So, <coughs> and so now, a little theorem which requires explanation. It's very simple, but just you have to run through the definitions and uh, to check everything fits. That if these omega i's are amenable, then if you take this dimension of x to the power gamma divided by omega i's, you get back dimension x. Well, provided this x is not terribly pathological. I'm not certain that compact spaces multiply by themselves even, yeah? The dimension does multiply. I just haven't followed the literature exactly how bad situation can be. Eh? Well, definitely, the topological dimension is not multiplicative, not additive for products. And, well, there are all the examples, but, but it's kind of the question is known. But I just was lazy to check the literature. But in our examples will be just manifold, so and you do have it. If this was a manifold, you do have this formula. So it's the first example. So it satisfies kind of this basic requirement. Now, we have to look so to see what happens to other examples. So let me indicate briefly what uh, we have in store. Next example, another thing which you wanted to match it, is the case of what happens to similar problem for linear spaces. Now in linear spaces, you do very much the same. You can consider, again, you have your group gamma, but then you have uh, underlying space will be something like r to the gamma, and then the gamma x here. But then, of course, in analysis, they don't have, take such a huge product, and they take something smaller inside, and something smaller will be this L2 of gamma, right? Take only square sumble of, sumble of functions. <coughs> and then this space has well defined dimension, mean dimension, you defined by von Neumann. This is von Neumann dimension. The question is if you get the same number here. Must be careful in what sense because they're very, very far from being compact space. Yeah, this by no means a compact space. On the other hand, here the action of gamma is isometric. 
right? On the compact space, very far from being isometric. However, you get the same answer for amenable groups. The beauty of the phenomenon definition is makes sense for any group gamma. It doesn't have to be amenable. Unfortunately, I don't know what happens in what to do with non amenable groups. But in any case, <coughs> for amenable groups, you kind of extend this definition, extends this definition of phenomenon. I shall in a second give you a way how to think about that. Not only for this product, but for subspaces there. And uh, so, what, how you can do it will be something like that. Yeah? Well, let me give an instance of that. So imagine you have this, I prefer to say Rn to the power of gamma, yeah? But there is, you don't start from dimension one, it's too small. It takes an infinite product. And then you can see there's some linear subspace there. Uh, my the way we'll define this linear subspace will make sense simultaneously in my category and in the L2 category. And so my linear subspace inside, now this contains, this contains this L2 of gamma. And then it, there will be some linear subspace, case, say, y is a zero inside. And, and then this y is zero can be viewed from my angle as a part of uh, some com compact space. It will make some compact space out of this. Or I intersect with L2 of gamma, and I get L2 space. And the dimension will be the same. So I want to say that if you, so, 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 and the, the, the example I have in mind is very simple. When you just add, so you have this, how you think about this picture? You have these gammas, and to each gamma you have variable attached. So you have infinitely many real R and valued variables parameterized, enumerated by gamma. So I have one here, one here. And then you can add some bunch of linear equations. You take some bunch of those and add some linear equation, and then transport this equation everywhere. And when you do that, you can say, well, I look solution for in L2. And this will give you in the phenomenon framework. Or I want to limit to something compact. So how to limit to something compact? Just in my infinite product, this Rn, some big power, I take inside compact subsets and compact domain in one of those Rn. And then this compact thing to the power gamma also sits there. So I have a compact ball about the origin, and they multiply infinitely many of them. And then again, I can intersect this space, uh, impose these equations only on the part there. So it will be not the whole linear space, but part in, in, in here, right? So it will be a convex subset of growing dimension. Now it will be compact. So in one case, in the phenomenon case, out of this equation, out of the same equations, I get a Hilbert space with a gamma action, isometric gamma action, or I have this infinite compact, infinite dimensional compact convex set with non-isometric gamma action. And the point is, you get the same number. Either you take for Neumann dimension, or you get my dimension, you get the same number, which requires a little, little proof, yeah? Which is not terribly difficult, but you get the same number. Then the same, you can look at more general kind of equations, and um, you get the expected number in, in, in more situations. If you add equations, you have so many variables, you add equations, and you get the right answer. However, there was some question I couldn't resolve at this stage, and just I can formulate it, which kind of I'm using, and indicates how limited our understanding is with basic geometry. And the question is as follows. Let's consider a ball in CN, where N is large, and inside we take a K dimensional, K dimensional complex algebraic variety, passing through the origin. Call it, I don't know, Z. Yeah. The question is, is it true that this epsilon dimension for small epsilon, for the epsilon less than one or less than one half of this z equals its actual dimension? And of course, we know kind of the complex algebraic variety spread, but, well, if it's spread uniformly enough, for that it's unclear to me. It doesn't impede applications. Yeah, when you start looking at these infinite products, this problem kind of become cancelled off eventually. But I think for the eventually, uh, for, for, well, for some situation, it would be nice to know that. <coughs> this is a kind of kind of an invariant which rarely apply to complex algebraic varieties. No, no, for fixed epsilon. No, oh, epsilon goes to zero, of course, yeah. But say take epsilon equal one quarter, yeah? Of course. 
or maybe epsilon depending on dimension or something. But uh, I couldn't make any example. I haven't thought much when this become less. Than for, for linear space, by the way, uh, for linear space, uh, if you take, for example, a cube, yeah, this little exercise, take a cube, unit cube in a high dimensional space, and take a linear subspace. And this epsilon dimension for epsilon equal one half, they capture the dimension of this linear space. And, well, that's not a difficult thing, but this is a kind of elementary kind of geometry involved. This is a... <coughs> it's, it's, you need a little bit to think about the classical dimension theory, what it tells you when you have epsilon inside. It's certainly, I, I think, it were kind of known, or was known and forgotten, yeah. Uh, pretty certain it was known to Urasona people at that time. Now, I want to look at more uh, interesting examples. Okay, so, well, this is actually, I think, a good example. So maybe I want to kind of say the picture which I have in mind is as follows. So you have this kind of nice object, like algebraic manifold. And you, you love it, certainly. You love it so much, you're willing to repeat it many times. So it is manifold, and repeat it at every point in your lattice, which means you multiply it by itself. Yeah? And you see this thing growing, yeah? and dimension growing. It becomes kind of bigger and bigger and bigger. And you, well, first you want to kind of comprehend the totality of that. So much you can recapture your original manifold. So looking over all this huge product, you still can see as much as you can see of the original manifold. And many things you can see. I said dimension, but you can, you can see infinitely more. Yeah? Well, I haven't thought things in detail, so I'm reluctant to say exactly what you can see. Yeah? But then, besides that, you can take some sub-varieties there. And these sub-varieties will be not like hypersurfaces or curves. They will be in the middle dimension. Yeah? They will have find mid, mid, mid dimension. And again, you expect that they, up to some degree, will be kind of products. And up to some degree, they're approximate products. And so, uh, Many things in algebraic geometry, which like let's think, think, think like left theorem, yeah, require here completely new, completely new features. And especially algebraic variety, I love them for the reason that you can connect them with more traditional finite symbolic dynamics because you can reduce the modular p. And so if you have simple algebraic equations, infinite chain of equations defined by equation integer coefficients, you can reduce the modular p, and then you have traditional invariants like entropy. And they're related, yeah? This is say dimension and entropy are related. And um, actually, some of the work I've done was motivated by somebody else from Tony Brook, who is not here, is x. And he's not here, I think, also by the fault of Simons. And because some theorem of x I generalized in this framework, yeah? Where reduction of modular p is kind of crucial. So, and now yes, I want to turn to this uh, dramatic example to say a couple of words about them. How this dimension works. <coughs> so, so one group of examples I repeat, is for, for me most attractive, the infinite dimensional algebraic varieties and sub -varieties, which are products and their sub-varieties, yeah, about which you can say much in this dynamical framework. So dimension is just the easier thing to describe, yeah. But it's much more fun if you say, well, well it's working with Poincare polynomial. What happens to the average Poincare polynomial? Yeah? Quite interesting object. <coughs> and then, so what are these examples? The example which I was mentioning already was like map of, say, harmonic maps. So the harmonic maps from Rn to some Riemannian manifolds. So this will be called X, yeah? So you think about this as a, just Rn. I'm sorry, no. It will be x to the power of rn. It's just such a mess, yeah? Who is who, yeah? But, but again, the space of all harmonic maps is too big for my purpose. And I consider only those maps where differential is bounded. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. I would rather put a constant, yeah? So I have a compact space, yeah? I fix a constant and do that. And I have, I have the space, and this is my space x of those maps. And so the first simple observation from a kind of classical elliptic estimate, what follows is this dimension, which I haven't defined truly for continuous groups, but by, by definition is, however, it's quite simple. It's the same definition. You have to say the right words in a second. I say one way to say it. That this dimension of this x divided by this action is actually finite. Of course, it may be zero. The space may be empty, kind of. It consists only of constants. First remark, first remark, it is, uh, it is finite. Now, how we define this dimension? And one way to do it, 
as the use of the previous situation, but first compact space. So it's, it's now Rn, compact space acting. But what we can do, we take we can take lattices inside, yeah? We take lattices inside and just limit our dynamical system to this lattice. And this will be the definition. It's not very kind of intelligent way to do it, but it's the fastest to reduce to what has been done before. So we can think about that. Actually, the proof is of the following nature, that <coughs> if you take actually this lattice sufficiently dense and limit your harmonic maps to this lattice, then the map is actually injective. This is what the proof amounts to. So the space embeds into the discrete product of copies of this Rn. And this is kind of really easy interpolation theorem, saying that you have a harmonic maps with this bound, and the two of them agree on a dense set that they agree. So this is kind of a simpler part of the matter. And this is quite general. And the similar thing is true for minimal varieties. Oh, OK, I'll make, I say it in the, last, in, the, in the last part. So it's one part. Secondly, of course, you want to know that sometimes you want this dimension to be positive. And it may be zero, may be positive. For example, if you put here something like a torus, whatever dimension, this space will have zero dimension. However, if this is a sphere, then dimension will be positive. And essentially, <coughs> it is positive if and only if, well, you have to be precise, when there is a bubbling phenomenon, when the harmonic map bubbles. And then this count kind of the average number of bubbles. So this is what dimension measures. For example, the easiest case, if you take map from C to Pn, yeah? Holomorphic maps. So they're holomorphic maps with bounded derivative. There's a space extensively studied by people in complex analysis. And this space indeed has positive dimension, though it's hard to compute. Yeah? It depends on certain normalizations. And a friend of mine, complex analyst, Iromin, can compute this up to a constant of 2. Yeah? So you can know it within interval a, a over 2. And amazingly enough, by the way, it doesn't depend on the dimension of here. So in, in, a way, in a way, this space doesn't grow when n grows. Yeah? That's kind of an interesting feature, which uh, for the moment is unclear to me why. But again, already for maps, for meromorphic functions, yeah, it's already kind of a nice thing to have in mind. Yes. You can see these maps. And what essentially this says, how you prove that, that you show opposite to what I said, you're saying that if you have Again, now sufficiently rare net of points in C. And you prescribe the values of your map at this net, then you can reconstruct, you can, you can produce some map. So you can solve interpolation problem in this class of functions, like functions bound derivatives. So it tells you that the space, that the space of this map is very close to actually product of discrete set of copies of the receiving manifold. And then, of course, on the next level, you don't even know how close they are. So this is a very preliminary very preliminary result of the stage. So these are examples which we know. So in general, of course, you may ask what happens for, for general algebraic varieties. Yeah? This may be. And again, this is question has been studied from time immemorial. So what is the space of maps from C to, to projective algebraic variety? When is dimension positive, when it's not positive? If, if there is a rational curve here, it's obviously from this what I said, it's positive, and you may naively think this is if and only if it slightly defines classical conjectures. Mm, and, and this is slightly more approachable. When you know the dimension is positive, then well, there is a chance. Yeah, this is exactly what you want to say. This if and only if there is a bubbling. And the, the way you can prove is this stage is a very weak form of this. If you can sharp form of this, this would imply what I say. If dimension is positive, then there is a rational curve by using this complexification principle of Grothendieck. So how attributed to what wrong there. Actually, Grothendieck invented this, and it was extensively used in algebraic geometry, how space of maps compactifies this bubble the rise and this all his old paper. Now, my final example will be the spaces of sub varieties in the Euclidean space. So now we take Euclidean space, for example, maybe a complex space of corresponding dimension, and you look at the minimal sub varieties there. I don't know, actually, better name V. And uh, again, this space, if you look, take some naive topology, Hausdorff convergence on compact subsets, but you want to be compact. 
And for that, you have to normalize them. And so what you say, that intersection with every ball of, fi of fixed radius R has volume. So volume of this intersection is less than some constant. Then. You choose a constant and just work with this constant. So they kind of have uni uniformly bound the density in the Euclidean space. The density in every ball doesn't exceed some limit. Then one knows this is a compact space. On this compact space, the Euclidean space acts. And then I must admit I haven't proven yet in full generality that this has finite dimension. I can prove it for, uh, this is maybe difficult, I, I don't know, it depends. At the moment I was stuck with the geometry of singularities. It's easier, but relatively manageable for complex algebraic case. When you, when you can use some resolution of singularities. In general, I, I, I must say I cannot prove it, though it looks to me a plausible statement, at least is a question, yeah? So what if this dimension of this space with respect to this action is finite. And again, you can prove it's positive if, uh, so in the, uh, of, uh, this doesn't have to be Rn, it's a more complicated situation, so in Rn it is positive. Indeed, yeah, say for the case of complex algebraic varieties where I made the computation, so it's sometimes positive. So, this is a, this is a case of the dimension, and yeah, so I may, pause here and then indicate some, something more general in, in this respect, what I can say. So, but maybe well, now. So I can see the ball, so fixed radius moved everywhere around the spot. No matter where I move the ball, intersection must be bounded. Right, so no matter where I look, density is bounded. And then it's invariant under translations, and it's a compact space with this topology. And, uh, I believe dimension always find that. Well, this is a natural thing to uh, expect. And uh, in, in modular, some conjectures about singularity is immediate and probably can be true to, proven without, but I haven't thought enough to claim it. So, maybe ask me something else, yeah? I, I feel better, otherwise we have to go to something more difficult, you see, if you don't ask me now. <laughs> yes? Mm. Well, see, this is a kind of different, it's a slightly different issue, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, see, it depends on the metric. So, so but it's related to, to another unsolved question, actually, uh, who, who was immediately kind of observed by Benji Weiss, that um, how this dimension is related, related to topological entropy. So in fact, you can relate them and can think about this, kind of make a house door type of definition and see how they're related. And one question which immediately arises, conjecture is as follows. If you have a topological space, compact topological space, where this dimension is positive, then entropy is infinite. So this thing kind of never leaves together with entropy. You cannot have both of them finite and non-zero. So if entropy, topological entropy is finite, this dimension must be zero. And this related somewhat to this question about asymptotics. This is the way how you change the limit and how things develop. And there is some ongoing work by, by Weiss with his student Linden Strauss where they relate this very much to classical things in dynamics, biological dynamics. But of course, this rate of convergence is not, strictly speaking, topological invariance. It depends on the metric. Right. But, uh, but basically what you want to understand is in this framework you have to compute it as for many examples as possible. For example, this is somewhat easier to compute than entropy for groups different from, from Z. Say so entropy is quite difficult to compute as fees uh, would watch just for only for a lattice. Yeah, have a, so a subshift of finite type inside of a lattice, yeah. Typically entropy is not computable, right? There are very exceptional case when it was computed. Is it correct? If you just give you on, on a random, just describe sigma finite type. So here, here values 0, 1, and then you take a window, and say in this window you allow only certain configurations. You take the same window, move again the same class of configur configuration. So you describe, take some shift of finite type defined by the, what you are allowed to see in the window. And then it has an entropy, but typically it's in computer. Nobody knows how to compute it. Nobody knows if this is a log of algebraic number or not, yeah, for example, T typically. Of course, there are, I think there are examples where it's known to be not even a constructible number. I think so, it follows from, 
what people done in, in this respect about you know, machine Turing realized by that and, and so forth, but cellular automata. But yet, for simple examples, you expect it will be simple. And there are many examples, where, well, kind of exceptional examples when you can compute it. But in general, however, entropy, dimension is much easier to compute. Um, this is dimension, in, in many cases, you can show it's exactly what you expect. You have so many variables, so many equations, subtract them, and this will be the, uh, the right answer. And uh, very many examples, not totally. I, again, I cannot prove the most general expected result of this nature, but it's true very often. However, if you kind of um, become a little bit, you this kind of true for, for the generic situation. But if you uh, or a, start aging equations, yeah, situation change kind of radically. This kind of works in a way when you have underdetermined situations. So this dimension, so to speak, is positive. But positivity of dimension implies that it's underdetermined situation. For example, if you start with fibers being one-dimensional and you add only one equation because you transport everywhere. You just kill completely this dimension, so dimension becomes zero. So what kind of zero? This, of course, next level of understanding. Still, the system may grow, but then it has the dimension. You can make the same definitions, but you have different rate of, of growth. So instead of this cardinality, you have pu put here cardinality with some exponent. Like if you look at the function satisfying certain differential equation, and then the determined by the either by initial value data or by the boundary condition, and then the number of points here will be different exponents. And what kind of exponents may appear here? This, well, for me, it looks well, quite difficult to decide. Yeah? It's rather subtle things concerning um, uh, equation attached to them. I haven't thought about that. I wonder if you can have kind of funny numbers there. On the other hand, this prediction with numbers may be sometimes completely misleading, because if a Cauchy-Riemann system, we can think that, so when you have working Cn, and then everything determined by that data on Rn, and so I think the exponent must come from here. But it's not true. The right exponent comes still from the growth of the whole ball. As I said before, typically the space of map from Cn, something Pn, has positive dimension. So the, these maps have positive dimension. Actually, the way to prove it, uh, it's uh, because it's pointing for Neumann dimension for the space of holomorphic function may be positive. It has the same, the same flavor. Though, kind of slightly different mechanism, but the, exactly in the same way as for Neumann dimension, appears like in the section of a line bundle due to the positivity of the bundle. And so you can think about this positive bundle as section of it like meromorphic function, not a bundle. And this got blow ups give you dimension. And here this comes from blow up uh, for bubbling phenomenon. So it's again blow up, which, you, know, you count the number of bubbles anyway. But still it had this exponent. So yeah. Actually, I don't want to go further. Yeah? If I go further, I have to start. Uh, next invariant is much more complicated than this one. And I don't want to go into that. And actually, in fact, I don't know very well just where it goes. Yeah? So I can start my definition, but I can't work out the examples. Yeah? I think I can figure out some candidate physical systems where this was motivated by, but could you tell us what physical system you were looking at? Well, my physical motivation was of some way different nature. I might say they're very f kind of far from that. And the, what I was trying to think was that other classical quasi-physical problems like self-avoiding random walk. So you have something like self-avoiding random walk. And this is a tremendously complicated thing to understand. So I avoided the problem. So I don't hope to understand it, but so I slide to something which you might try to understand, right? So it's again highly dimen high dimensional space, though it's discrete, but I hope this thing may converge. So I just I want to popularize this problem because I love it so much. So you just work on a plane, you have a lattice. And so your original space, you consider this graph, linear graph, and you can see the, the space of maps of this graph to this graph. And this is a random walk. Yeah, for every n, you have a space, which is uh, uh, the space of all walks, but what it is is just 0, 1 to the power 4, right? At every moment, you can go in four directions. So this is the space, oh, what the hell, what the hell I'm saying? Yeah. It is 1, 2, 3, 4 to the power n. Yeah? That's the space. You have four possibilities, you repeat them n times. But what's important, this is, has geometric realization. You have a map, each point here realized by actual path. And so the theory of random walks is as follows. 
take a random point in this space and look at it, you have a path. And first there is a theorem which says that all random objects are the same. Yeah? You cannot tell one from another. You can describe them in a certain language and the answer is the same for almost all paths. And, and we know this very well. For example, the diameter of this will be about square root of n. But now we take not all of them, take only part of those which have no self-intersection. And just ask the same question. I believe even the first part of the question is un unclear, right? They're all the same. Is it known or not? Probably it's not. But even assuming that, assuming they're all the same, how they look like. So what is the diameter? Is? Yeah, it's believed to be n. Maybe somebody tell me what power is supposed to be here. Hmm? Well, you get It is exact, well, I mean physically exact, not mathematically. Ah, so by now, uh, uh, so. Yes. And so the, the exponent is known. Yes. But uh, so exponent, of course, is bigger than one half. But I still think there is no rigorous mathematical proof bigger than one half, right? Right. right. So you cannot prove that things diverge faster in this case than in the unrestricted case. So you expect, yeah, it's hard for the thing not to avoid itself. Of course, it's going in this spiral, yeah? So how it goes by the size of our square root of n. But you think it's certainly this very exceptional thing. You think the number of the spirals by far less than the number of the self where you walk. So a typical thing is kind of will be this kind of loose spiral, right? And that's the first question which is an answer. So when you think about geometry of these kind of configuration spaces, it's certainly so tough, yeah? So look at something easier. But you generalize and just this was motivation. Yeah. There's, there's some relation between self and avoiding random walks and fractional dimensional LDAs, and maybe that can be some use. Engineers who study these things study it using the fractional calculus for ODAs. And I wonder if there might be some way to prove something. Yeah, well, I'm even the worst for me kind of unfamiliar. Maybe you'll tell me this after the talk. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. So maybe it's worth mentioning that about dimension four, you know, what happens. Right. It's a little like hard. No, of, of course, you know, infinite, infinitely more in, in high dimension. But I guess you can still ask difficult questions, yeah, even high dimensions. Like in topology, yeah. To some extent, become easier, but still, you can say something about paths and high dimensions. But uh, there are so many other kind of configuration spaces, and this, of course, exactly kind of non-local thing. Yeah, the, this random walks are so so complicated, and uh, counting things like entropy or size may be more difficult. The dimension, if you allow more parameters, so in larger space, you may end in a more friendly environment. So, so my purpose is to create as many kind of examples of mathematical models which are friendlier than this, uh, uh, this some way random walk, but kind of motivated, but it's indirectly. Yeah. Okay, so I guess it's time to speak now. <coughs>